I'm Michael Hawley. I'm the director of the research and academic program at the Clark. And one of my favorite activities is um, uh, welcoming people like this to something we call a colloquium. It means they can propose something to us. We agree that it's a really good idea, and they get to choose who they want to come talk about it. And they can talk about it sort of un behind closed doors for two days, and then they come and tell us in a great uh, grand fashion what they've been talking about. And this particular one was called Agency in the Renaissance, and it's uh, co-conveners are these two women right, he r right here. So do you want to introduce yourselves and then introduce your, your uh, partners? Good. Um, <laughs> first, uh, thanks for being here. Um, my name is Anne Dunlop, and um, you've, uh, Jean Campbell here has introduced herself in a moment. Um, I'm one of the two co-organizers, sorry, up it goes. Um, what we thought we would do is introduce ourselves and then Jean and I would summarize a little bit some of the discussions that we've had uh, sort of as in camera, as it were, in the last two days. Um, right up. Is that better? I, sorry about that. Anyway, so I was saying um, what we thought we would do is first introduce ourselves, each person, um, and then uh, Jean and I would talk a little bit about some of the issues that have come up in the last two days that we've been talking about, some of the reasons that we had proposed for why we proposed the event, what we hope to achieve, some of the things we did or maybe did not, and then uh, open uh, the, the event, the floor for discussion, not only from <coughs> the other participants, but of course from you who have uh, come this evening. Uh, and I'll just take over very briefly and say that I'm Jean Campbell and I'm coming here from Emory University in Atlanta. And um, I want to kind of do the official thanking thing. This is a remarkable opportunity uh, that the Clark affords uh, for people who are working on uh, things that collide in certain ways to come together to see what they can make out of a discussion behind closed doors where people are more inclined to be a little bit experimental uh, and a little less formal. And it's really one of the few places that you can do this. And I really want to thank uh, Michael and Aruna who uh, kept us organized. Um, got we us here. Got <laughs> us here. <laughs> she and Deb <laughs> Fair. <laughs> and all of uh, the people in the programming office that uh, helped with this as well. Um, so I think with that, what we'll do is we'll just go down the line and ask everybody to really briefly introduce themselves, uh, and uh, then we can proceed from there. Marvin Trachtenberg. I'm at, uh, I teach at the uh, Institute of Fine Arts of uh, New York University. My name is Megan Holmes, and I teach at the University of Michigan. Stephen Campbell, Johns Hopkins University. Claudio Cerivia, Sapienza, University of Rome. Uh, Carl Schalke, Philadelphia Museum of Art. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I should have, I'm Anne Dunlop and I'm at Tulane University and like everybody else here, um, I work on sort of 14th and 15th century Italian art. That's uh, one of the things we all have in common, I would say. My name is Klaus Krüger from the Free University in Berlin. My name is Rebecca Muller from the Goethe University at Frankfurt. I'm Paul Hills from the Courtauld Institute in London. Adrian Randolph, Dartmouth College. Uh, okay, I thought uh, Anne and I discussed how we might open this up and one of the basic ways that we, we thought would be useful is tell you what our basic concerns were in um, in formulating this uh, colloquium and bringing all of these wonderful participants together. And that is basically, uh, we, and I understand from Aruna that in past programming you rarely have um, programs that are as field specific as, as this one and we really appreciate that you made 
that possible. We are all scholars in one way or another of early uh, Renaissance art, primarily Italian art, and uh, that could seem like a, a, a kind of a conservative or reactionary claim, uh, claim, but there it is, and one of the things we want to say is that there are reasons why it seemed kind of appropriate uh, to think about uh, what it is that we do at this juncture. It's certainly the case, for example, in this country that the study of uh, early Italian, what we all in the field tend to call early Italian art and architecture, has, has become marginalized, and that's a, a, a fact. Um, and it's a sad fact to us, and, and one, of the, one of the most basic uh, uh, thoughts we had in organizing this was to not just take that as a, a fact and retreat into our corners, but rather bring that out into the open as a question. And the question is, is a kind of a many-piece question, that is, what is what have we done to marginalize ourselves, uh, if that is an issue? It, to what extent is this uh, perceived marginalization part of a marginalization of humanities in general in this country? And uh, what the links between those things might be? But also in a more, rather than sitting back and lamenting the fact, uh, we really thought that it would be a healthy thing to uh, kind of try and pick up the energy by bringing th people together and seeing uh, what they're thinking about at this moment. So we came up with a set of terms, and I mean, we keep reducing this, and we have been reducing this, as, as Professor Hills uh, uh, pointed out earlier today to just agency in the Renaissance, but in fact the title is Artistic Agency and Early Renaissance Art. And what that's really intended as is a kind of juxtaposition of terms that signify something for us. So we didn't, it wasn't simply accidental that we uh, chose the word artistic, uh, it, that, in a sense, was a kind of a pushback against uh, certain kinds of anthropological models that uh, place uh, issues that make our focus on uh, the object as a mediator rather than the series of choices that go into making an, a, a thing and how those issues go together. That also explains our, our choice of the term agency, because one of the things that we wanted to do is think that kind of juxtaposition between what people responded wonderfully. One of the things that comes out of this is that if you put an art historian in front of a picture, at least ones of our generations, they suddenly become or a piece of architecture, sorry Marvin, <laughs> they suddenly <laughs> become very animate. And that's a, that's a really, uh, so it lives. Um, <laughs> like Frankenstein. Like Frankenstein. Marvin uh, talked about the pictures. Exactly, Marvin also <laughs> talked about the pictures. Uh, so that's, uh, that's a very good thing. Uh, but there's clearly, at this juncture, at least within the academy, a kind of disjunction between that vitality and our, our presence. And uh, that's a concern that we all had. Uh, the second concern, and that's our general concern that we were trying to flag with the words artistic and agency, we also uh, have are concerned with uh, historical uh, specificity. And once again, that's not a rejection of what's been a turn over the past uh, decade or so towards anthropological models. Uh, it's not a rejection of the anthropological models, but rather a wondering about at what po uh, how we now go about describing historical specificity. So we did define a kind of canonical period 
uh, one that actually, uh, according to the thesis that we set forward for ourselves, does represent certain kinds of, of issues about authorship, as which was a common topic that came out, about intentionality, about uh, effects and how uh, the, those things uh, play out, about reception in relation to effects. Uh, so there were all kinds of uh, issues that kind of we helped to, we hope to kind of recuperate uh, under, by flagging those terms. And I think that Adrian put it very nicely when he, he said the d invitation was a, a kind of a thought bomb. <laughs> uh, it was kind of intended as such because it seems that we need some kind of bomb at this point. Uh, and <laughs> uh, <laughs> or not, I don't know. <laughs> we can discuss that. <laughs> so that was our thinking. So maybe we c I'll, I'll turn over to Anne now and she'll kind of give a very brief summary uh, of, of how kind of things turned out from, from our perspective and then maybe we can open uh, up for responses um, from the various participants and see if our perception of what we were asking for and what we got <laughs> uh, maps on to yours in any way. <laughs> um, right, so I think uh, many of you maybe are familiar with the, the basic structure of these events, but I'll, I'll just up again. I'll outlay very briefly what's happened. So, you know, over the past two days, each person here has spoken a little bit. Um, we had three different panels about how they understood these terms, artistic agency in the early Renaissance. We had also to prepare this meeting, you know, because we're from all over. We, we, very, we very much wanted a, a wide range of opinions and a wide range of approaches. So to make sure that we might have something to talk about when we all got in the room together, um, before we met, we asked each person to prepare a short position paper, w you know, laying out a little bit how they understood these terms, how they understood agency, what it seemed to mean, um, and how they might go about addressing it, what they thought the issues were. Um, Jean and I also put together a short group of readings. Uh, a number of the participants also uh, suggested readings that we were able to circulate so that each of us, before we arrived, had read a little bit, um, not only some central texts in our field, but also uh, other people's preliminary thoughts. Um, so we came together in these three panels, and um, what seemed to emerge, I guess, uh, were two things. You know, when we set up artistic agency as our, our, um, our problematic, our problem, um, we were thinking that our own field, uh, oddly, is, is a very good, these are, of course, you know, what an artist does, what an object does, what an artwork does, how these things might overlap or not. Anybody dealing with any form in the end of cultural studies, cultural uh, analysis deals with a lot of these issues. But we thought our, our, our own field was a nice place to come back and anchor some of these debates because um, it's a moment, this early uh, Renaissance in Italy, where the idea that the individual maker is uh, important to the work, is part of the work, is, um, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm finding this hard to hold up my mouth. Um, but you know, that, um, that the individual maker is important to what the work is and how it gets made. Um, yeah, try the other one. Okay. Yeah. Better. <laughs> I think it's just me. I'll hold it like this. Um, anyway, so you know, the, the, these terms are actually things that are being laid out as problems in the early Renaissance itself. So it seemed to us it might be one of the things that our own field could offer to other fields in art history, maybe the humanities, to look again at how these debates came into being in the period, what was historically specific about them, and how we're talking about them now. Um, what emerged over the past couple of days, there were a number of threads, and I'll summarize them only very briefly because uh, we want to make sure that everybody else has a chance to speak, and particularly that you, uh, as the audience, have a chance to uh, 
to intervene, to talk, to participate. So, you know, what happened in many ways is um, artistic and agency um, in some ways came down as debates either about the artist as a maker, the, the role of the individual in making, how that important, how important that might be, um, in relation to either the artwork, the object actually acting in the world, acting on its viewers, uh, the idea, of, for instance, that an altarpiece is supposed to lead you to grace, um, or um, you know the the idea that agency is is about social relations, that artworks and individual makers within any system of of art production, 15th century Florence, whatever it might be, are subject to certain um, rules, cultural conditions, and that those also will determine what gets made. Um, we ended up with a number of different ways of approaching this. What uh, many of the participants did was to look at um, how individual artists or architects or makers either set up this problem in their own work, how you might see it in the artworks, how you might see it in the writing that either they produced or that others produced to talk about what they made, um, how the the, the actual breakdown of theory and practice might have taken place. So, you know, does it matter? Um, Marvin, for instance, uh, who gave our first paper, talked a little bit about how, um, you know, when you're making a building, um, we think of the architect in some ways as the author of the building. His point is that this was a very odd position because, of course, buildings take a very, very long time to make. And in practice, this happens over very many years. Um, one of the themes that came out around the artist was that when we're talking about artists in this period, we're often talking about workshops where people have different levels of creative involvement, in some cases even have different levels of freedom. Um, Carl Strelkham on my left talked a little bit about situations where the workshop with the master actually has important presence of slaves or a slave who are making works on their behalf. How do we understand that? Um, we looked a lot about um, how the work uh, uh, acts on kind of um, the individual viewer, what the viewer brings and what the viewer expects. And I'm aware as I'm laying these things out to you that they're very abstract, and so it might be more useful at this point to throw the floor open to everybody else and to uh, invite you to uh, talk um, if you're willing um, and any questions you might have <laughs> as you're assembled here about um, what it was we we talked about and um, conditions or conclusions we might have raised. Should we just start and go, yeah, go, sure. go through? Well, what I did in my paper was to uh, to take the idea of agency to. Can you hear me now? Is this good? Okay. I I, uh, I, got, I took the idea of agency to mean I shifted it to the idea of authorship. Agency can mean a lot of things. I, so I, I directed it toward the idea of authorship, and of course, authorship implies a work. If one authors a work, author and work, it means one completes a work, and that completion of a work, whether it's a, uh, a book or a painting or a building, makes one an author. And this seems like obvious to us today. When you think of a building, you think of its author, right? You think of the Guggenheim Museum, you think of Frank Lloyd Wright, you think here of Bill Bow, you think of uh, Frank Gehry, and so forth and so on. It's built into our, deeply into our culture. Now, this depends on a certain way, a certain procedure, that is deeply embedded in modern architectural uh, culture of the way buildings are thought and the thinking and making of architecture. Today, there is first thinking and then making. All the thinking occurs on one side. There's a complete plan, right, down to every detail. There's a contract, it's signed, it's funded, everything is done, and then it's built, usually by a team of you know, contractors and so forth. And there aren't any changes, essentially, it's finalized. This enables you know, the architect's idea to be realized as a work of which the architect receives credit for 
the authorship. This is so obvious to us, it, it sounds, I'm sure it sounds a little simplistic to even have to explain it, but this is the way we work. Now this is not the way architecture always worked. In fact, if you go back to the period in which we were studying, if you go back to the 13th century and the 14th century, in the first place, buildings took a very long time to build. They took decades. They took a generation. They took several generations. In some cases, they took several centuries, like St. Peter's in Rome took 200 years about to build. The Cathedral of Florence took almost 200 years, and so forth. So we have many generations, many participants. So this, 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 this kind of problematizes the whole idea of authorship. How can, how can there be an author, a single author of, of this of this, um, of this kind of, uh, within this system. So uh, what happened, what, and there wasn't, the point is there wasn't, essentially, in the 13th and 14th century. Buildings were not credited to a single author, by, it by and large. And what happens as you move into uh, the 15th century is that there appears to be, there's a shift, and there's suddenly the idea that uh, authors are needed, authors are wanted, the builders themselves start to desire the, uh, the, to acquire the status of being an author. But this is very different, given the th difficult given the way that buildings are made. There seems to be a contradiction. And uh, the resolution of this contradiction, uh, or the way in which the, uh, the period coped with this, uh, uh, there were several, several modalities. Um, one was, uh, the invention, a kind of reinvention of reconceptualization of the way a building should be made. Essentially, it was Leon Battista Alberti, the great Renaissance uh, the writer, theorist, architect, who conceived the idea that first you, you he rejected the, the way uh, architect work, which I call building in time, this idea of building in time rather than, he, he invented a, a kind of a method called building outside time. And what he meant by that was you design everything and then you stop and you finalize it and then you build it. In other words, he invented the procedure that we use today. This was invented, published in 1450. It wasn't really put into practice until many you know, centuries later, but that was one invention. It was a kind of a fiction. It was an ideal, it was an ideal really futuristic program. On the other hand, you have communities that suddenly start to want their buildings, their major buildings, to have an author. It becomes important for a famous name to be attached to a building. So there's a kind of fictional authors. Buildings acquire fiction. Excuse me, Marvin. Yes. I'm just thinking about uh, yes. different things here yes. and um, how you've mentioned yes. Alberti. Yes. And I was just trying to see who yes. could get the conversation going with that. Um, you know, he appeared in various forms during the conference and, right. and cloud his paper. And, uh, Talked about yeah. classes, and then and Stephen, yeah. who talked a lot, uh, who uh, likes to uh, minimize yeah. uh, Alberti as much as he can, uh, for <laughs> <laughs> uh, particularly in very both 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 of yeah. these uh, uh, participants in very subtle readings of of Mantegna's yeah. work in, and I'd say um, quite different readings maybe, um, in different aspects of it. So um, I mean, it'd be interesting to see how other people might uh, think of um, Alberti's uh, effects across this whole world of agency. I don't know if someone would like to. He has right his works. About Alberti, I think that uh, it's uh, uh, interesting to introduce uh, a problematic about the relationship between the paintings uh, and the text, uh, the, uh, the relationship between the artist, the painter, uh, with the uh, humanist, um, and uh, it's uh, interesting uh, to um, to understand if the painters is uh, uh, is in relationship with the humanist, uh, because the humanist is a literate, is very important, is a, is a, is our uh, culture, and the painter sometimes is uh, only an artisan, a maker. And uh, I think that uh, um, in view of the agency, and it's uh, interesting uh, to propose uh, a parallel uh, lecture of the work of the artist and the work of the humanist. And uh, 
Sometimes it's possible, and for, for in my opinion, uh, this is the case of Alberti, uh, it's, it's possible to discover that uh, uh, Mantegna is the artist about I, I spoke in this day, um, work, works uh, as uh, Alberti writes. Uh, in the sense that uh, uh, both of them um, uh, look and uh, think about uh, uh, the works of art, uh, Alberti, uh, from a point of view, theoretical point of view, uh, Mantegna uh, from an uh, artistic point of view. But uh, I think that uh, both of them describe and represent the works of art as uh, an object uh, very um, life, uh, with, uh, with life, uh, um, and, uh, and, uh, and I think that uh, now uh, we have in front of you the work and the text, and uh, we can catch from um, both of them what they um, say to us. And, uh, and I think that the um, uh, organization of the work and the organization of the uh, text is uh, similar because uh, both of them are um, uh, the object that is, uh, is full uh, uh, of a many, many um, uh, information and full of a theory is full of uh, work of the artist and full of the uh, thought of the uh, humanist. That's, ex that's exactly the, the point that I was about to make, which was that Alberti, uh, it didn't. No, no, just to, to finish what she was saying, Alberti, just to reinforce what you were saying, Alberti derives his theory of the author from the literary world. So it, 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 it further elaborates this, 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 this knot between humanism, literature, art, and architecture. So yes, um, uh, Claudia is addressing what we can call a common project between the humanist, who's probably an amateur artist, he says he's an amateur artist, uh, Leon Battista Alberti, who writes this very famous book on painting in Latin, and then in Italian in 1435. Um, I'm interested in an artist, and like, as, as is Claudia um, Mantegna, who's a generation younger. And uh, the issue with Mantegna, who's a master perspectivist, who very famously has this kind of archeological approach to antiquity, and he makes these statuesque figures, you know, uh, with, with a tremendous sense of severity and uh, ancient gravitas. And, um, the most refined kind of painting you could imagine. Mantegna has always been, often been, most commonly, treated almost like a textbook illustration of Alberti's principles of art. Yeah, this is how you do perspective. Um, a painting should be thought about as a view through a window, and you know, how you transcribe by a sort of geometric map, you know, projection, how you sort of translate visual reality onto a two-dimensional surface. And then you should make comp compositions of figures which are noble and restrained and have gravity. So you can see why it's, not, it's no accident that these two artists, this, this artist and this writer, get coupled. So I am always provoked into trying to say how Mantegna is different. And what if Mantegna, a generation later, finds these principles restricting or a bit old-fashioned. And what if Alberti is also interested in, say, what we might call the agency of art? Uh, Alberti says that painting has a divine force to make the absent present. Let's say Mantegna says yes and more. Uh, more than that, um, beyond painting just being a virtual window onto reality, there are many other kinds of artistic making. Um, there are many other kinds of image. Oh, we, you know, there's a heritage of all kinds of images that if you were an artist working in Italy in the middle of the 15th century that you sort of might want to come to terms with. There's the cult images in churches. Um, some of them believed to be very old and believed to be painted by St. Luke or by an angel and they have a miraculous efficacy, a miraculous agency. 
Um, there is the new art coming out of Florence, the fantastic bronze sculpture of Donatello, who arrives in Mantegna's hometown of Padua to make a great bronze altarpiece. And then there's the heritage of antiquity, these objects which are regarded you know, ambivalently for their beauty and for their idolatrous power. So Mantegna actively thematizes the different kinds of agency, the different kinds of force, uh, miraculous efficacy, um, technical, technical, technical competence and illusionistic force, um, and you know, idolatrous magic uh, in, in his work. So without showing you this work, you probably know Mantegna's famous um, interior of the camera picked in Mantua. That's mainly what I was talking about. So here is how Alberti became a point of connection between several of us, at least three or four of us. Yes, I mean, I, I think you're hearing uh, a little bit of our discussion hinged upon different notions of agency, depending on whether we're talking about the artist having agency, being bestowed some power by an interpreter saying this is where the, the, the force of the work came from, whether it was lodged in the object itself, uh, somehow autonomous from some artistic producer, uh, or whether it's lodged perhaps in reception. I mean, those, there are other subtle ways of putting that, whether it's a collectivity of producers, a collectivity of objects, or a collectivity of viewers. There are, there are different ways of inflecting this problem. And I suppose I, maybe I'm wrong in doing this, but I also want to draw in the audience into this discussion a little bit to see whether there are any points of contiguity, especially with other fields, since that was explicitly one of the goals. We're all very deeply into our own material, and we can try describing to you our very particular projects. I'm curious whether anyone is interested in a different era or uh, when we say some of these words, whether there's a resonance or a resistance. Uh, is agency perhaps in your mind something completely different? Uh, did you have a different preconception of what we might be discussing? Uh, that might shed some light on our own blind spots, the way in which we've been talking about this topic. So I just thought I'd frighten you all by asking you uh, if you had anything to contribute. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. It's not a word used by Wolf you know, Berenson or uh, S.J. Freeberg or people like that. So obviously I'm from a different generation. I, I do appreciate the way you're using it. Um, I do want to ask a different question. When you said you were, mar I'll come back to it. When you said you were marginalized, did you mean, and that's news to me, did you mean within academia, within art history, or just within America? Uh, it's, I think it's, pro and I, I think the Europeans can probably speak uh, more to this, but it's certainly the case that the study of early Italian art, for many reasons, uh, has, has, some of which are very old. That is, that it is set between various definitions, uh, epistemological, et cetera, of, of, of art, really. Uh, so if, if it's true, as uh, someone like Rebecca Zorak has pointed out, that, that Renaissance art history in general has, has become a kind of a uh, whipping boy for various uh, problems about modernism that have more to do s very often with the discussion of modernism than they have to do with the discussion. Okay. Uh, it's, it's even more true, I mean, if you take the, the a and there, the re in the Renaissance in general, its gravity is not focused, uh, that is, the definition of that field is gravity is not focused towards uh, the 13th and 14th centuries, it's focused towards uh, circa 1500 uh, and, and, uh, and has traditionally been so, and you can see that in all, in all kinds of, of manifestations, and it lingers as things do in institutions. Um, so I think that in part it's a question of institutions, but also in part I think it's a question, I mean one of the ways that I, uh, when we originally proposed this, we put the question agency in there because it's something that's being discussed across fields. And, um, 
And, and it wasn't random, because one of the things we always have to do, because we can't avoid uh, the problem of, of coping with modernity or, or whatever we talk about, because those are the conditions under which we operate. So... Just a slight response to that, I would say being a museum person, actually in the English speaking world, we've had uh, exhibitions on Renaissance portraits coming to New York, on love and marriage, on virtue and beauty, on several monograph, very important monographic exhibitions. So uh, Renaissance has not completely no, been uh, a a de dead and buried. <laughs> yeah, and the public <laughs> wants it, but uh, uh, the. Um, what if we said that? What if we didn't really say that? <laughs> well, that's been kind of a yeah, we've spent two days um, <laughs> debating that um, and discovering, you know, for instance, that a number of the native tongues of the participants don't contain any cognate. Um, in the barest sense, let's say, and the way it's often been taken out of anthropology and other fields, it's the ability to act or the actor, right? It's the, um, the, 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 the one who changes the conditions that pre-existed, let's say. And so one of the ways that it's come into art history is this debate about what is the actual work that the work does in the, in, in the social uh, fabric, let's say, and then what is the work that the let's say the agent, the, the person who actually is making the work, or the people, or the collectivity that are making the work, and that's not a good word in English, but um, you know, w what is the work they're doing? So the, the, the stress is on some kind of active um, uh, relation of actor and receiver, and uh, obviously this can be reciprocal. And the question that we were all asking is, well, how do we actually break that down day to day in what we say about artworks and what they seem to be saying to us. I should also say was the impact of art is more than just aesthetic. Yeah. That it has other kinds of causes that other kinds of effects. Hi. Um, back to the opening question about marginalization, which was extended to um, the humanities in general. One of the first things I thought of um, was last week here, we saw a lecture by the contemporary artist, Carrie James Marshall, for whom um, the figure, the human figure and narrative are very important, and that applies to lots of contemporary artists. So in light of that, what do you think that that objective in contemporary art and early Renaissance art history could potentially say to each other? I mean, I'm not sure I, 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 I mean, I, I, I'm not sure I can. I mean, the marginalization of humanities and then Kerry James Marshall and the figuration and the Renaissance. I mean, the things, I'm sorry, I don't mean to critique it's your question. Fake. I'm just trying to think what could I say that would uh, answer that. I think it's interesting how there are various turns to figuration in contemporary art that may draw on. I mean, he doesn't particularly draw on Renaissance art, so I don't know where to go with it. But uh, I, I think there is a way of the enduring way in which figuration offers the hope of a type of agency. We talked a bit about how figures in paintings, let's say, as a medium, are, of course, just flat representation or representations which have no meaning. And however, when we're confronted with bodies, you're confronted with a, a, a type of fictive personhood. And I think, uh, you know, the Marshall paintings confront us with various politics and uh, uh, difficult things to confront. Uh, one of the questions for Renaissance art history, or early Renaissance, I don't know uh, how we put it, is do those objects have any contemporary traction as well? In other words, it's fine to think of them simply in their own time and place. One of the things I think I've been encouraging us to do is to think also about how they impact us today as, let's say, in a, some interpretive fashion. We are dealing with these things. They are in our world. I don't think we can close them off into some special place. So I would uh, make a claim that when we're thinking about 
agency of the object, the figuration within the object, we ought to be considering issues of contemporary import, which for me do, does mean certain ideological constructions, which may be a little out of fashion if I'm gauging the temperature of uh, the group, uh, but in terms of gender, in terms of politics, perhaps in terms of race, I think there are some issues that uh, we could perhaps activate in terms of figuration. I'll leave it at that. And I just want to add that I think that's precisely one of the questions, that is that in a sense the there are some ways in which we are kind of responsible for the marginalization, that is that to retreat to one's own uh, territory. And uh, one of the things that you can observe, and it wasn't a completely uh, flippant um, observation that I made, is that, that within, and we're not all of us, of, uh, one of the kind of failings I feel uh, that we didn't quite fulfill was to get some truly younger scholars here. Uh, we're, I don't think we're ancient, but, <laughs> but uh, as a group, but, but uh, the tr truly younger scholars aren't here. And um, I think that, uh, <laughs> well, they, are, they are over there. <laughs> that is, they're not up here. Um, so I think that uh, one of the current concerns has to be uh, the translatability, uh, that, uh, that uh, we have to figure out how uh, things that have been interesting to us or might be when we retreat back into our, our uh, corners and keep us going are translatable in ways that are, are relevant, be that political, uh, be that something like uh, uh, aesthetic, um, there are possibilities. And uh, it is kind of remarkable that when you put people that are our age or older in front of a picture, they, can, they have compet competencies to, to produce a kind of translation. Uh, that is potentially uh, translatable. And in fact, that's one of the things you saw uh, Paul Hills and, and certainly I and I think you know many people doing was when they were given the chance to talk about artistic, they, they went for it <laughs> in one way or another. And I think that was kind of an interesting thing. Could, could I just come in, come in there? Um, I, I don't quite accept, actually, the idea we've been marginalized. I think it's just that we were once um, absolutely dominant 50 years ago, all major art historians trained in the Renaissance, uh, and that's no longer the case. And um, certainly in, in, in Britain, I don't think uh, uh, Renaissance studies are, are, are marginalized. Um, but if we have a little bit of marginalized ourselves. I think it's because we've lost confidence in what I regard as some of the supreme aesthetic qualities of Renaissance art. And many of the contemporary artists I know, um, for them, for instance, early Sienese art is absolute touchstone. And we in the Academy are, have been for too long embarrassed to talk about these aesthetic qualities. One of the things, I mean, I mustn't generalize about the whole <laughs> panel, that would be wrong of me, but uh, there has been a strand within it that has been prepared to use the word aesthetic, um, maybe I'm not sure beautiful, but um, artistry, artistic. Um, and, uh, uh, and I think that is uh, a good thing and the queues around the block currently in Berlin to see the Renaissance portraits, um, uh, and uh, uh, Karl has has mentioned the popularity of, of 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 Renaissance art in exhibitions, shows that the I know there's a certain kind of hype, a, a kind of Leonardo effect, <laughs> but um, that people do still recognise some kind of touchstone of quality and some and that is a key moment uh, in the history of figuration and the emergence of art as uh, uh, <laughs> the, the kind of art forms that we, we know. 
Uh, Paul, I just want to uh, respond. I rem early Sienese art I know has had a great attraction on contemporary arts. I did a show, uh, participated in this curator of a show a long time ago on Sienese Quattrocento painting, and I remember taking Cindy Sherman there, Ellsworth Kelly, um, numerous artists who, who had a great interest in this, but I think that even that has shifted a little bit in the last few years, and if you went to the Biennale in Venice this past summer, uh, it's very shocking. You go in in the first, in the main pavilion, and they brought just from across the canal the three great uh, Tintoretto paintings of the creation, things like this. And I think it was a really dubious curatorial decision, and I think a lot of our artists were very uh, mad about this um, need for association with a, a tradition which was uh, really outside of their discourse, it's just as a counterpoint to that. Um, <coughs> I have a question. Uh, okay. um, I was lucky enough to hear s uh, some of the discussions, and um, so I'm thinking about the issue of marginalization, which has come up here perhaps more forcefully than uh, it was in the last couple of days. Um, that uh, what is the role of periodization? Um, notions of period in the so-called, what has been seen as a marginalization. How do, how do ideas of what is appropriate in a period, what's possible in a period, what is um, characteristic of a period, actually um, serve as an obstacle to opening the, dis the, the field up to, say, the more speculative fancies of theoretical innovation? I, uh, maybe uh, I, I made a, a point uh, during the discussion uh, upstairs that I thought the uh, 14th century was marginalized and gone, been uh, sort of like one of those icebergs that breaks off and goes back into some other uh, region. And um, and I'm uh, a little disappointed by this, but because that's an area I find really extremely interesting and still a, a foundation point for at least the Italian Renaissance in a later period. But I think there's some realities and, and, and a lot more excitement happening in uh, discussions of the 15th century. I'm not sure if this is really this defining the Renaissance for you or talking about periods, but I, it, it shows how uh, the clusters of interest are, are, are forming in the last uh, 10 years or so. But I think Stephen has some. Just kind of very briefly along the same lines, um, I think we're, Many of us would work on what we could say we would call the long 15th century, um, which probably extends a little bit into the 16th and probably covers the 14th century as well. Um, <laughs> uh, because, well, ideally, but uh, we work on the pre-Vasarian in some ways. Something crystallizes, uh, there's an ideology of Renaissance which crystallizes around in, in Vasari about the artist as genius and the supremacy of certain cities um, in, in Florence. Um, this period, this pre vasarian period, is one where that's more up for grabs. We, we, we have something in the course of formation which becomes very, very decisive in the Western tradition. And I think what's happened in our field is that we've all been rolled together as early modernists with, say, people who work on the 17th century and the 18th century. Um, and whereas, you know, you would have, been, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, have had a Renaissance person, uh, an Italian Renaissance person, a Northern Renaissance person, and a Baroque person, now you would, that would be one job. And of course, it's inevitable that this happens. It's understandable that this happens, given the um, tremendous like, um, rise of interest in other fields of art history. So it's important in some ways to, um, you know, you know, while acknowledging this, to, um, it's, you know, to, to recognize a certain kind of period, periodicity within the early modern, and to actually talk about it whatever we call them, epistemic breaks, overlapping epistems, um, you know, um, I mean periods of time, periods of time which are not, which, which might be successive, might overlap a little bit, might get a bit messy. So, yeah, I mean, that, that's, does anybody else want to? Um, uh, just two, I have two uh, reactions, one sort of personal and one larger. Um, so I trained in uh, England and came back to North America and somewhere over the Atlantic, 
Um, I went from being a medievalist to a Renaissance person. Um, so, you know, there are very blunt ways in which, in putting the 14th, 15th century together, we're actually doing something that is not normally institutionally done. Um, so, you know, there is that simple barrier. Um, in reaction to your other question, it strikes me, you know, um, what Paul was saying a moment ago that um, 50 years ago, strong, you, you know, the, the center of art history was in the Renaissance. One great legacy that we have had from that is that we had an enormous legacy and we had, by, by which I mean that we had a whole series of methods that had actually been developed in relation to our own field. Um, and I think as the methods have shifted, um, those methods fit so well that it's been harder to find ways to make those breaks. Um, and you know, at, at, the, at the center of what we were hoping to do here, I think was to try to go back and see what was still in some of those methods that we might actually think about again and think forward. Because, you know, I, I, I think that um, having had tools that were so well adapted to particular kinds of questions that were asked, um, tools that came out of the very material we were looking at, we Renaissance or um, closeted medievalists like I am, um, it's just harder, I think, to shift in some ways than it might be. Did you want to? I'm fascinated by the potential connections between the issues related to visual culture that you've been exploring over the last two days and the theory and practice of textual editing during this period. I'm thinking particularly of a figure like Lorenzo Valla. Could any of you talk a little bit about early Renaissance conceptions of the text, the author, the editor, the editor's relationship to the recovery and remaking of the text for a modern audience? Are there, are, are there such connections during this period? <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't quite know where we'd start. <laughs> um, my, again, I mean, first of all, I want to point out that uh, perhaps one of our failings is that Anne and I are, are both grounded in the 14th century, and that's where our principal kind of historical, um, <laughs> we've developed our tools of analysis. And there's a lot to be said about uh, uh, textual culture and uh, and the such of various kinds. I mean, in the 14th century, one of the areas that I think is very important uh, for understanding uh, issues like uh, constructions of uh, re relational uh, positions is scribal culture. The scribal culture of the 14th century is incredibly important. And, uh, it, it, you know, one of the obvious manifestations of it is someone like Dante, who we tend to think of as the great poet, but who is at root uh, a scribe. That is, that is where that uh, flourishing comes from. Um, so there are, uh, that's what I would say. I mean, some of the, the issues about the divisions of uh, and one of the interesting things about scribal culture is that there's absolutely no hard line to be drawn within that the scribal culture between pictorial uh, pictorial language and scribal language. So if you see a b one of my favorite examples of that is the statutes of San Gimignano, which is something that I worked on uh, as a w d once upon a time, a very long, long time ago, as for my dissertation, where there's a kind of wonderful interplay between uh, the, the writing down of the statutes and the kind of pictorial uh, indices uh, to the contents of the statutes. And one of my favorite ones is a, a statute that says, 
uh, not to uh, kill birds with bricks, so apparently this was a problem, <laughs> has a wonderful uh, little drawing beside it of a, of a flat bird, a kind of heraldic flattened out bird with a brick on top of it. Um, so there is this kind of wonderfully tangible connection rather than disconnects uh, the differentiation of modes of, of uh, scribal production and pictorial production, one of the things that really interests me is the kind of collapsing of those, those areas. But that's something that starts to change, I think, uh, and, well, definitely starts to change in the, in the 15th century, and I think probably Stephen is our most competent person to speak about that, I, no? I'm not, I'm not, but I just got an, you know, I just, I was thinking about your question, I thought of an answer. Um, because one of the things we didn't talk about this in the last couple of days was the idea of, um, that's taken a real beating, the Panofsky, Panofsky's idea of the learned artist and of learned literary inventions and are artists humanists? Um, you know, I've had people say to me, well, are you saying that Mantegna could read Latin? And I'm not necessarily ever, you know, saying that. You don't often have to know what's in book. I mean, you don't have to be able to read a book to know what's in it sometimes. Um, but <laughs> uh, so, so we, we, but we do have this issue. What would it mean for an artist to be a humanist? Um, and at the other end of the scribal, um, you know, sort of around 1500, we do have an enterprise of textual editing, um, the, producing, the production of definitive editions of texts, and the formation of textual canons which all relate to the rise of printing, which comes out of the, the, the kind of textual scholarship and humanis humanism that you're talking about. Um, humanism is concerned with largely text-based pr um, pursuits. Some of them are interested in objects and material culture. Artists get very involved in the material culture of antiquity um, for reasons that they are often called upon to evaluate and sometimes to restore ancient works of art. Um, we have, there's a show in, in Washington in a few weeks about the artist Antico, and Antico was a maker of small bronzes for collectors. W at the enter and he also restored colossal works of art in Rome and signed them very proudly, Anticos Mantuanus. With, Man with, with Antico, you get the formation of a kind of a visual canon, a canon of ancient objects, which parallels the rise of, um, I would say, literary canons. Um, you get like, you know, the Apollo Belvedere, the Leacoan, the Spinario, and so on being sort of, the, you know, the Belvedere and the, 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 the Antiquities of Rome being turned into a kind of standard edition of antiquity. So that's one analogy I would perhaps draw. Yes. Uh, sorry. No, no, go okay. okay. Um, we heard a little bit about authorial agency in the case of Mantegna in particular. Um, but Dr. Campbell, you mentioned something about the magical power of, of art, and I was wondering, which I think also is the subject of your research, Dr. Holmes, so I was wondering if you could comment a little bit more about the nature of agency, the artwork itself having agency. Um, uh, art and magic, I mean, I, ta I talked about it just very, very briefly, because there's still the idea of the ancient artifact that might be magical. That, that might, that might uh, exert powers on, um, often nefarious powers uh, on, on people around it. There's, it's still a culture that um, you know, is invested in astrology and the harnessing of influences to the use of objects, through the manipulation of a kind of vitality in the cosmos to the use of objects. Um, the, the fa a famous story that you know, I'm, I'm sure several of my colleagues can, can speak more about um, is the Sienes have a statue of Venus by Lysippus on the Fonte, on the, on, on the Fonte Gaia in Siena. Uh, at a certain point, things go very badly you know, for Siena. Um, they lose a few wars, they smash up the statue, and they bury it in Florentine territory. Um, so the bad luck about this, you know, this, this ancient magical pagan object will be transferred to the Florentine enemy. Even then, um, in the 1490s, uh, what we were we able to discuss, well, famously, 1501, 1502, discussions about the placement of Michelangelo's David. Um, I'm sure you, you probably know this. There was, a there was a town meeting involving artists and other um, craftsmen um, and a musician to talk about where to put Michelangelo's David, and the herald uh, who convenes the meeting says, 
well, you know, we, it's not appropriate that out there on the piazza we have the statue of the woman cutting the, men, the, man's, head, the man's head off, Donatello's Judith. It was erected under an evil star, and for that reason, the war against Florence was lost. Thank you. Um, maybe thinking a little bit about ways to tie sort of what we do with sort of habits of, of viewing and experiences in contemporary society, that one of the ways in which I was pressured, I guess, in the, in the colloquium by Michael Ann Hawley was to think a little bit, I guess you asked me to think about the relevance of affect theory on the kind of work that I do, but these are potent objects. These are powerful objects. These are things that elicit extremely strong responses from people. I work on, and here I'm a little bit of the anti-humanist. I'm somebody who sort of comes a little, pu puts pressure on some of the traditional categories within Renaissance art history. I've been working for too long on a, a <laughs> category of, it's a fluid category, it's hard to define, but highly venerated images, miraculous images. Um, a, um, a medievalist has no problem with just calling them living images. There was nice resonance for me with Claudia's paper where you talked about you know, things that are perceived as being living and alive. So these, um, and to some extent, images speak in relation to magical objects, in relation to idols, in relation to relics. We had in Rebecca's paper, relics embedded in altar pieces. So these are extremely potent, powerful things that um, act upon people, elicit responses. And so I think we, you know, I think, again, you know, I, I didn't know how to respond to your question, but I have, you know, looked at Jell, I have looked at Mitchell. I think what I haven't done, and this is my limitation in how I imagine myself into the domain in which I work, I don't think I've quite imagined what it would be like to be in awe fearful, sort of beholden to an object. And that's where some of the ways in which we respond in contemporary societies to things that really have that kind of effect on us. We think our objects do have that effect in some way s whereby, I'm gonna translate this to the experience of putting us together in a room, we couldn't stop talking. People would put images up on the, you know, project them and we were supposed to sort of quietly, passively listen to their account of these objects. But they move us. They, you know, have some kind of way of elicit eliciting very strong responses. So I think there are ways in which um, I certainly would like to find a more appropriate way of conceptualizing this potency. So, and uh, if I can just add to that on the example of the Venus in in uh, Siena, that. One way uh, of reading it, and we see this in someone like Michael Camille, is an example of, of uh, idol uh, the problem of idolatry. Uh, but it is also, I mean, it's important to know that what the reason we, the way we know about that is from Ghiberti, who uses that as a foundation story. So the, the kind of, uh, and I think this is actually one of the themes that may uh, be coming out of the discussions is the relation between uh, a kind of, uh, the problem of the relation between something that looks more like it's uh, a product of the controlled agency of uh, something uh, coherent and this magic that underlies it or produces it. And I think that that is also a way in which we can uh, kind of uh, open up the discussion uh, from something that uh, arises from our confrontation. And uh, to go back to Keith's uh, question about uh, periodicity, it, it provides, at least for me, a kind of way of, of giving shape to something and uh, for better or worse. But I also think that uh, it, it is capable, that is, the, if we are conscious about it, the looking at whether they be chronological limits, the issue of what was translatable from English to German, for example, came up, so they might be linguistic limits, the ways in which those things might produce a, a kind of format for, uh, uh, for trans, a new format for translating something vital uh, that we get from looking at uh, the, these things that we uh, study with much, it came out with, with quite a lot of 
desire or, or love. I don't know what to call it exactly. Um, so that's, I just wanted to point out, I mean, the Ghiberti story is kind of perfect that way. Hi, I'm Nicola Courtright. I've just hurled myself back into <laughs> Renaissance art in Italy after something like five years <laughs> of not teaching it. So I'm reading many of you with great pleasure, <laughs> rising at four in the morning to read more about what you have to say. So thank you so much for what you've been doing. So my question was uh, what I have been challenging my students with, which is uh, one of Didi Uberman's books, Confronting Images, the English title, where he challenges you and me uh, with the whole problem of should we really be addressing with, with such uh, kind of finiteness and, and, and cutting offness uh, uh, what artists' intentions or the agency of an artist was. So you were getting at an alternate view with the magical properties, with the power of art, that kind of thing. That certainly transcends what the artist might have placed in a picture or, or a sculpture or a series of people with a building. But I was wondering whether you had thought about uh, uh, this distinction that he makes between uh, the visual, something that we currently can e try to find and f find in a work of art and begin to take out of a work of art, uh, as opposed to the visible, which is something that we can more uh, define more exactly and put our finger on about historical uh, facts and figures and iconography, that sort of thing, whether in fact, uh, this is where I'm wandering to, whether in fact one of the issues with Italian Renaissance art and its perhaps fading interest among at least undergraduates is that uh, we have kind of killed it off in a little bit, in a little way, that we, we, one has to know a great deal. There is a whole magic circle that one has to enter into and understand before one can actually, before one can actually say something of significance about it. Whereas what Didi Überman is trying to make a case for is that we focus on the visual, which is not something that is iconographically determined or paid, determined by the patron, that the visual begins to give us places to go that may not be necessarily defined by peoples at the time, but may have a certain veracity anyway in our current time. I was wondering whether you had been talking about that at all or whether he's passé. Does anybody want I can try and point you out? Uh, if you want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I can do I'll do it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean that is that was kind of uh, maybe not explicitly addressing George D. D. Uberman, but as as Keith pointed out, uh, after my talk I'd clearly been <laughs> working with George George D. D. Uberman. I think that in, either explicit or implicit, when Anne said that the way that people coped with uh, putting together artistic and agency was to uh, think about uh, the artist, uh, it didn't necessarily imply uh, that a, a, a whole figure or a a single thing. It implied a way of naming a place where we could uh, attach. And there it was a discussion through many of the papers uh, where uh, that is uh, what do we do uh, with that impulse which is related to the issues that Didi Uberman uh, talks about as well. What do we d do within that impulse and how do we uh, redirect it in uh, ways that we don't lose uh, something that are actually productive uh, now? So uh, the simple answer is yes, we were concerned with that. Only in a few words uh, with my poor English, uh, but I, I try to um, to synthesize the uh, position about the agency of Adidio uh, Berman uh, with the uh, word that he uses. Uh, the word is a symptom uh, or symptom. 
symptom. <laughs> it's a symptom. Georges uh, de uh, take these uh, words from psychoanalysis, uh, uh, but uh, is uh, uh, in this uh, way, I think that the symptom uh, is uh, a word uh, that uh, uh, translate uh, the, mm, the, 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 the construction of the agency. I did uh, speak with uh, George de Lieberman about the agency uh, directly, but I think that uh, he uh, agree with this uh, uh, idea that uh, inside a work of art it's possible to uh, catch uh, what inside the work or inside the image emerge and is significant. And in this way, uh, he uh, overcome the problem about uh, style, form, iconography, uh, and so on. It's the work that uh, uh, speaks, uh, and uh, from the work uh, we can uh, catch uh, what in the, in the work, in the image, uh, emerges. It seems to me the problem is that the, as the, 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 work, the work speaks, but it speaks many languages, <coughs> and uh, n uh, innumerable languages, and not all of us uh, know all the languages or accept all the languages, and this has been always a bone of contention. I mean, extreme positivists would say you can't say anything that someone at the time wouldn't have said or thought. That's one extreme, and then the other extreme is just open interpretation and absolute reception. So it, it's not, it seems to me, this is, people are going to have very different ideas about whether there should be limits on interpretation, where one can go with that, and so forth. And I, I think many of us have, have probably experienced in, in presenting interpretations, uh, someone from the audience saying, you can't use that idea, it's a 20th century idea, and we're working in the 14th century. And I always say, um, well, what would you like me to use? Your 19th century idea? <laughs> well, the question that I have actually relates uh, so closely to what Marvin's been talking about and, and definitely Megan and Nicola. Um, and it, it hinges in some ways on a word that um, Adrian, uh, Adrian used as well, which is autonomy. And in my own work, uh, I care much more, so, uh, it, or what it would appear, about practice rather than theory, necessarily. But I think this question has to do with, with practice, not necessarily even as it relates to scholarship, but teaching. And, and it also speaks to the marginalization or perceived, in my view, marginalization of Renaissance um, images when they collide with you know, video art, digital art, installation art, things that move, things that speak. And it has to do with actually a phrase that Marvin used, which is that all of a sudden around, let's say the early 1400s, roughly, buildings begin to desire things. You actually said that, I think it was about the Duomo. The Duomo desires fame. And I have a feeling you probably used that phrasing quite deliberately. Um, and my favorite thing, again, speaking about teaching practice to assign to my students is Mitchell's article, uh, which asks, what is it really that pictures want? Um, and just in terms of the way that both curators and, and, uh, and faculty members introduce Renaissance images in the way that they work in very potent ways, the way that they perform. Um, how valuable do you think a question that is to pose to students? I mean, it's a provocative question. You also don't want to you know, animate paintings as if they are necessarily living, moving things. But um, in what ways can we, in fact, bridge the historical distance and make them perform for someone in the 21st century? Adrian, you want a response? Then we'll have a last question from Cameron. Uh, but we can talk maybe afterwards. I was just thinking, I mean, that the, the, the adoption of that phrasing is also claiming a certain minority status for the image, uh, as if the image is somehow you know, outside of a certain discourse when it comes to word image relations in Mitchell's work. And uh, I'm not sure, you know, that it, it was something that was running through our discussions about, you know, how can we talk about the autonomous image in a certain activated metaphoric way outside of certain protocols of language. I mean, that was certainly one of the things I was at least playing with. I'm not a hard uh, 
uh, ideologue about not using linguistic metaphors, but it's clear that many of the metaphors we use have to do with language, and there's a question about philological uh, metaphors is a very powerful one in the field since Barbold and uh, as many of you will know. And so I don't know, I think it's an interesting provocation to think, and I think Paul, for example, is trying to think about what images demand of a viewer through the activation of drapery and in how drapery can provide a type of mental space for an engagement with the image. Uh, so there are ways in which the image has certain characteristics, protocols, norms, form, shape, scale, etc., that demand something of viewers. And I think you know, we've talked about agency and intentionality. I think your question draws us more into the, the realm of reception as well as uh, the activated object. So it's a very banal, perhaps, response, but uh, maybe it's something that can provoke us to think about as we move forward with our various projects. I think the hour is drawing near to the last question, Cameron. All right. Um, yeah, so to come back uh, maybe sort of nicely to the beginning and the introduction, um, you mentioned when you were when you mentioned the you know marginalization of the Renaissance and it, you you came to um, you were talking about sort of dissatisfaction with anthropological approaches um, or if maybe maybe I didn't understand right but I, I I thought you said something to the effect that there was a kind of common denominator that the panel were sort of uh, you know invested in the object as opposed to as opposed to a more anthropological approach. But it will to come to the question, uh, and then you can throw it out if it's if it's not based right. But um, would be to to sort of ask, you know, what or, or it was a response to that that you said the panel is con convened, uh, you know, as a kind of response to a certain inadequacy in the way it was being treated. And so I would sort of I'm sort of asking if you would uh, kind of clarify what that inadequacy is and whether you feel that that. <coughs> Uh, you know, sort of sharpens your sense of, of where things need to go next. Um, I'll start and Anne will finish. First of all, I, I think that uh, our double concern was to take on board the anthropological models and, and also consider their limitations. Um, and when it comes to um, d uh, what we hope to maintain as a kind of uh, a historical grounding, however you take that, and for some kind of value. Um, so it isn't that there's a, a discomfort, but there's a, there's a kind of a, a discomfort, and it may be good, it may be bad, with them as the answer. Uh, so just to take an example um, for myself, uh, one of the general readings that we put out was is by a German scholar named Niklas Luhmann. And that is an interesting thing uh, for me uh, because who is not an art historian, uh, so he is he is approaching uh, broader issues of, of so, so social uh, agency. Well, he not with the word agency, obviously, <laughs> um, but there are places in the engagement with that anthropolo Not really. It's a, a kind of sociological model that help me, but they help me because they slow down my, uh, pro the way that I process my understanding of confronting information. So they shape my confrontation, but my question on top of that is what do I do then to, uh, having done that, what does that get me uh, when I go back to the uh, the materials that I'm dealing with, and how do those things? How do we talk about those those kinds of fits and non-fits? It's also a constant problem that most of these broad questions, as I said to begin with, are directed at answering questions about modernity, which is a very tricky thing for for uh, working in. Uh, not just in our field, but in any pre-modern uh, field, P 
partly because these fields are kind of traditional bat battlegrounds for defining the modern, even when there are all kinds of other things going on within them that become invisible or intractable. So I think that it's less a question of putting those models aside than thinking about really what we can do with them and what, what, where they work and where they don't work. Um, so that's the answer to the question. I also want to uh, say that it wasn't our intention. Uh, Anne and I, and it's a kind of irony of this that that we were, our original hope was to kind of focus on the 14th century. Anne and I both ended up talking <laughs> about the 15th century. And it's really, it is a question, uh, when I talk about marginalization, it is not, for, first of all, it's not true. I want to point out that, for example, in, in the UK, <laughs> work on that field is, is very active, but it is a phenomenon in this country that it, it's very dispersed and it's, it's not so active, at least within the academy. And I do need to distinguish that from the museum field. So uh, I want to be clear that when we were talking about marginalization, we weren't necessarily talking about the Renaissance as a whole that uh, there are various structures that are built into uh, institutional, academic institutional settings uh, that make it, uh, d that give it a, a position that, that you have to negotiate in a way and that the sense, at least my sense is, is that we have to do a better job of actively negotiating it rather than taking it for granted. Can, well, Megan, did you can I add? I was just going to say that I think that um, you know something like anthropology puts pressure on us to sort of define what our relationship to the visual is, what our authority in speaking, you know, as um, professionals who trained in the visual, but also to sort of widen our. Um, sort of what constitutes the objects of our studies. And, and within our own group, we did get some criticism about the fact that there was too much um, focus <laughs> on painting. Too many of us were talking about painting. And even if we widen that, we hit painting, sculpture, and architecture. <laughs> but material culture you know, can really assist us in just even talking. The nice thing that a gathering like this facilitates is discussion with our colleagues. And I'm still, you know, Carl Strelke was telling me about the range of projects that he's currently working on. And it's phenomenal. And you know, ceramics and what he's been learning about ceramic production, individual producers in um, two different regions in Europe across two centuries, it was extraordinarily impressive. So again, I think it puts product, it's a dialogue and it puts productive pressure on us to stake out the claims of what we do. I think it's just about time. We've worked this panel so <laughs> hard. I hope you've enjoyed it. I think all us out here certainly haven't. We thank you.